And we are back again, Box Star Forum, one-on-one -on -one with the legend. We have a very special guest in attendance. We have, um, and, you know, in Box Star Forum, we try to keep it current with the, with, with the legends, but the legends never die. We have the one and only Jeff Thompson, uh, five-time world champion in uh, karate. He's representing his country around the world. And uh, we are pl pleased to have my man in attendance to educate me on a lot of things in life and sport. How you feeling, Jeff? Terry, feeling good, looking good, and making it real, <laughs> keeping it real. It's good to, good to be with you again. I appreciate it, man. It's been some time. It's been, what, three, four years since our last, uh, we last got together. Yeah, we talked about the world then and, and what the warriors from the streets needed to be about, what they needed to continue to be about. Mm -hmm. And now the world has changed. So much has happened from those of us from those streets. I think the combat sports, whatever sport it was, whatever pastime it was, it was a life requirement. And I think now, as we look at all things in the post-COVID area, which we will now live with, because history has been made, the racial identity of our, our purpose and what we stand for will always now become real and relevant, because I know who I am after May 25th last year, right. and will continue to know who I am as a result. But I think I just want to shout out a massive, massive note of remembrance for one one true legend and, and warrior in um, the late Marvin Hagler. Yes. Um, there, are, there, are, there are too many times where people pass that have made such an indelible mark on whatever their, 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 their art of combat, but what they did at the time where you needed role models who were just literally so authentic in their purpose and what they brought to their art and to their profession, I think it's a massive loss and one that we should note, remember and respect. Well said. Um, I won't even try to follow up on that one. Um, let's get right into it, Jeff, because we got a lot of meaty yeah. stuff to cover. Um, mm -hmm. first, first of all, thanks for being with us. Um, I want to give a massive shout out to our sponsor, Rika Properties. Brother's been doing this thing, Doug Fuku who um, is basically uh, head of this company, uh, R-E-K-A, Property Management in London. And he's been one of our main sponsors of this podcast. And he's been behind Boxstar almost since its inception. So I want to give a massive shout out to Doug. Um, the guys who run BoxFit UK, um, who have joined collaborations with us. And of course, Next Phase Fitness. So we want to really thank our sponsors for their charitable work and supporting the movement. Um, the first question I want to get into is something that maybe people have missed from our first uh, um, uh, podcast we did some years ago. What brought you to the sport of combat sport? Like any black teenager, I was struggling with my own identity. Um, I lost my father at a young age. We moved from Wolverhampton to the east end of London. And that wasn't a place you didn't know how to handle yourself, look after yourself, and make sure you held your own in whatever company you kept. Um, I needed karate, and the more I reflect on it now, so much at that time, I had my mother's strict West Indian discipline. It, it's always there, and it was strict Christian upbringing, but I wanted my own discipline, my own self-discipline. And I was really fortunate. I had global stars like Muhammad Ali, Arthur Ashe, you know, as, as a very diverse, and I had, you know, Pele. These, these are people that you look for, who look like you were achieving great things and influencing great things through sport. So for me, discovering karate was about being able to manage the National Front, who at that mm -hmm. time were real, upfront and personal. Um, the postcode lottery that you had of rival schools, all boys schools. So gangs are nothing new. Where there's poverty, there's gangs. If there's disaffected, disadvantage, as well as testosterone, there will be confrontation. So I was all part of that, but always kept on the periphery of it for whatever reason. I also sold West Indian patties and I had to protect my stock. So I had security reasons for an enterprise that I had, and I had my own self-preservation. So karate was the best thing that could have happened to me. So for, for, for the viewers in a, and listeners in America who don't know what the National Front is, could you briefly explain what is the National Front? Is it similar to the KKK in the USA? The National Front and the KKK and the KKK and the National Front. So the, the National Front would be the KKK's version in the UK. Correct. And, and, and what we're talking about in the 1980s, these, oh, these were 1970s. These were at a time where, through football culture, these were where the, the real sort of National Front um, and extreme views were expressed, were nurtured, 
and were given their chance to be expressed. Right. So to not be aware of a certain postcode that you never went into or else the chances of survival were remote. You, you know, when you, when you stop running, you have to stand and fight. Mm. So it was a prerequisite. Something I've instilled in my, my children, learn to swim because they say blacks can't swim. Right. Make sure you can run because we're supposed to be able to run. Yeah. But once you run out, run out of steam and run out of energy, you better be out of fight. Yeah. So run, swim and fight. Uh, yeah, excellent point. So, you know, coming up in the 70s and 80s, what was it like in England, in London pre pre predominantly? At the same time, the East End of London, London, depending on where you live, determine your life chances and your life opportunities. The East End of London was a, was a, a, a mix of very many cultures, but there were boundaries. You knew where to go, where not to go. You knew who to hang out with, who not to hang out with. You had teddy boys, you had rockers, you had, you had all this really massive mix of melting pot interests. But within that, there was a diversity of purpose and coexistence. But in, as I've said, that high male testosterone ego, you were gonna get the primal instincts expressing itself aggressively and at times violently. But that's where the whole infrastructure of youth engagement of sport, of arts, physical activity, cultural activity, allowed a lot of that frustration and aggression to be expressed into a structured, well-organized system of activity. And equally, the people who coached you, the people who instructed you, the people who developed you. Mm -hmm. So you could have a teacher in the classroom that would be in the gym after school. We had fencing, we had boxing, we had karate, we had judo. There was so much to help develop that mental, physical, emotional, um, resilience and emotional armor that you needed. So, so growing up in London, while you was going to school, so having yeah, in school, absolutely. This was part of your school existence. This was part of your school extracurricular activity. Okay. Beyond the school gate was where you had the fun. That's where you go to the all girls school. That's where the rivalries would begin. That's where you hung out with your crew, and your crew was were your peeps, and your peeps were the people that you relied upon, and they relied on you. And I was a bit of a loner, so I was a team player. I hung with the boys, but I had the ultimate deterrent in my mother. When I wasn't on point, I wasn't on time. She was the ultimate deterrent. So it was an intense, tough love, but I wouldn't change any of it. I had an extraordinary child. And people say, oh, you came from a disadvantaged background. No, I didn't. I came from a real, relevant background that had all people, but I knew who I was in my blackness, and that made it a lot easier when I was challenged by those who wanted to judge me on the basis of the color of my skin, rather than my character. And so, and, and this is all, this is mostly in the 1970s, this like school upbringing and the school structure. When did it all start changing? In, I mean, did it start changing in the 1980s? By the 80s, and as I progressed, you know, I got my black belt and then I realized, I discovered competition, it discovered me, and then I began to compete. And then obviously representing Britain, Whilst I was traveling and competing for Britain, that red, white, and blue, the communities I came from um, were experiencing continued deprivation, stop and search by the, the police, mm. you know, police brutality, no different to the United States. This is not new. This is a consistent MO and how our cultures have responded to it has defined us. So we were having riots. We had, we had the anti-apartheid league. We had um, that so much anti-racism efforts the 80s was a, a really powerful and I think societally challenging time because the real issues were being lived out in the open as we're experiencing now, ironically. But whilst I was competing for Britain, I was coming back to those communities, coming back to those streets and people that I'd grown up with. Right. And they were telling me that life was not improving. It was getting worse. And in those 80s, we had three major disturbances that saw the, the institutions and systemic culture have to, as they always do, have a commission, an investigation, a report and findings. Right. And as I was winning medals, I was beginning to be respected as that ethnic minority from a minority sport. And I had learned to articulate and, and advocate on behalf of my diaspora. So it was in that 80s window where I was a dominant and had the currency of leverage. I used it to be able to highlight the issues from the communities I came from. And were you becoming um, a, a voice box, so to speak, for that movement? So, for example, like um, if you think of the uh, Black Panther movement in the 1970s in the United States and 
various, uh, that sort of like became like a cult figure that transcended into the Olympics. And so will you be a part of that movement? Was there a similar movement in the UK? Yes, there was, there was, a, there was a very acknowledged brotherhood and sisterhood of black performers at world level, right. at whatever level of sport. Okay. You know, I, I was shaped and influenced by the Black Panther movement when I was looking for role models. Angela Davis was my pinup poster girl. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was Tommy Smith, John Carlos. When I saw that at the 68 Olympics, that stirred me. You know, Ali Frazier, you know, watching that rumble in the jungle. These were global moments where black excellence was given a chance to be respected by the global community. Right. You know, there would be no pay for view without Ali Frazier, with HBO. You know, th- these were globally iconic moments after Rash against Jimmy Connors at the Wimbledon final. What an unbelievable performance. Mm-hmm. You know, the black man outthinks the white man. They out- the white man's behaving as the black man, the black man's behaving as the white man. Mm-hmm. And it, it, w- it, w- it would always become black and white. But when we were winning for Britain, when we get to the end of year and when we're being celebrated for our achievements, there was a nod of recognition because we weren't winning for ourselves. We couldn't go back to our communities and tell them that we had failed. Now, losing is part of learning. Loss, yes. Failure, no. It was not within our DNA. There was no room for failure. The West Indies um, cricket team is a perfect depiction of that same collectivism. You had the African, um, Afro-Caribbean diaspora who took their two weeks holiday from their factory existence to watch that West Indies cricket team. And Clive Lloyd, the legendary West Indies um, captain and and, an icon and legend who I've worked with many years. You know, when he led that team, when they won, everybody who looked like us walked with a pride. They walked with a self-assured, you know, feeling of respect that would be afforded to them because it was the establishment sport. It was the colonial sport and we had excelled. And you know that, that notion of black power wasn't meant to be politically intimidating. It was simply to be societally saying we have social, cultural and economic value and impact. And as a result, we knew our value. So we were always supporting one another. We were always cross-referencing, see how we were getting on. But that was the extra edge that made the 80s for me so special. So it sounds like the 80s was obviously that golden era here in the United Kingdom, as well as it was in, in America at one point. Uh, when we talk about that golden era, you spoke, you spoke about Marvin Agler quite eloquently in the beginning of this podcast. And it, it, it was it's something to behold because in America, we always said the golden era of boxing was the 80s. And we yeah. talked about four henchmen or four horsemen, meaning uh, Marvin Hagler, obviously, rest in peace, uh, Tommy Hearns, Sugar Ray Leonard, and Roberto Duran. Yeah. In the United Kingdom, for you, it was definitely the excellence of not a team from England, but a team from the Caribbean, which was the West Indies cricket team. Yeah. And that became that sort of uh, nucleus where black folks sort of like galvanized themselves around an identity. Most definitely. And, and that inspired you. And so how did you take it on to your performances as a, because you became five-time world champion. And I want to share, I want you to share this, this. You told me this story a few times, but I definitely want our listeners to get this story. You were saying to me once, I remember correctly, that you fought, I can't remember where you fought in the world, and you said the difference between me and this guy is that this guy is fighting for a bowl of food. <laughs> he's going to kick my ass because he's trying to put food on the table, whereas I'm probably fighting for a medal. How did you take that, that mentality and attitude into your performances? I believe that every performer, competitor, winner, that, that strives for excellence, that strives to win and be the number one is shaped by their social, cultural and economic environment. You are a product of your environment. And I've always said the menace of that killer instinct and anyone who wants to talk about how civilized we are, why are we so a spectators, a spectators drawn to how we express our primal instincts, either through a team of combat sport or individuals who square off or in any team sport where there's an element of controlled aggression. And whenever we competed, because we were an English and British team, that many of our rivals said, this isn't an English or a British team, it's a West Indies team, or it's an African team. But when we went out there, we knew what we represented. And as a result, obviously in a world championship, 
you are going to face different cultures of different backgrounds with different motivations. But you know that square off when you look one another in the eye yeah. and you know your moment of truth has come. Mm -hmm. That for me was going to say, how much hungry are you than me? Because what I'm going to bring you is everything that I've had to experience from birth to this particular point in time. How hard I've trained, how much I've sacrificed, and more importantly, the shoulders of greatness I stand upon. So for me, I knew the only one who could beat me was me. If I allowed that mindset to be distracted at times when it did happen, but knowing when it did happen, when it, the mindset was right, and when we lined up, it was a team of black, Scots, a, a sprinkling of the English, but predominantly, we were misfits from the hood. <laughs> so we were bringing it from the hood. We were bringing it real up front and personal. And if anyone was going to beat us, you had to bring it and some. Forget the referees, forget the subjective scoring. Even when the bounce didn't end up as we wanted to, because of course they were there to stop us. Mm -hmm. They knew when they walked off that mat that there was nothing given, it had to be taken, and they had to bring that menace with them. That was the essence of British karate, of British sport, black athletes, sportsmen and women. We knew we were representing our community, our diaspora, and that gave that era of extraordinary performances so much more relevance. There is no greater feeling when you come back and you go to the gambling house or you go to the barber shop and you dangle that bling. Nothing will come near it, nothing. I mean, being a world champion is one thing, but you were multiple world champions. Was there anyone more special than the other or were they all equally as special? World Games 1985. Why so? You could, you could win your first, and I won double gold. I helped change the sport and take it to that next level. There is no greater honour than leading a, any team, but a British team because of what it represented. There is no greater honour. It's a unique club of those who lead a team, set the standard, set the pace, and the intent. 85 was a World Games. It was the Games. I always wanted to go to Olympic Games. So with karate not being Olympic sport, the World Games was for all non-Olympic sports. And this was going to be the other opportunity for people to see us, right. not only on home soil, but doing what we did best. And we were the dominant karate nation. I'd lost the world um, heavyweight title in Maastricht only a year before. So this was the chance to reestablish my credentials in that particular um, dominance of the, the category. And the World Games was a round robin, no team event. So there was no pressure of that. This was strictly about who was going to be the best in their own respective individual um, 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 category. Um, my, my then girlfriend was also competing in the heavyweights and I was coaching her. So there was this double pressure. But I, I remember getting through the prelims of the, the round robin. And then in the semifinals, I met Dagfelt from Sweden. Now, Carl Dagfelt, I'd coached in the 80s when I spent my early 80s time over in Sweden. He was a young teenager. I was now fighting in the semifinals. So what I taught him, I was now fighting my mirror self. Mm. But he didn't have the pressure of your homeboys in the stand, home mm. soil, and having to step up. Mm. I got through the semis, and then I fought another Swede, Leslie Jensen, in the final. Feel it now. Intensity, resilience, win at all costs. There is no allowance for failure. It was not on the agenda. And if you feel it and you've lived it and you've experienced it, you can express it now. And it meant everything. Why? She who became my wife won her heavyweight title the Saturday before. And she just looked at me and said, I'm going to my friend's wedding. You better go do your shit. <laughs> so I had no sleep that Saturday night into that Sunday morning. And then my mum turned up on the Sunday afternoon for the finals. So all I'll say to you is, it was the sweetest victory right. in so many ways because the streets had come to see their street boy. My mother had come to see it. Everybody wanted to see how dominant we were abroad at home. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's very similar to the 2012 Olympics being on, on home soil in the UK, in, the, in England, and all those UK fighters or British fighters that represent their country, i.e. Anthony Ogogo, Anthony Joshua, I believe Luke Campbell fought in 2012 as well. 
Lawrence Coley, our, our new most recent world champion, Hackney boy, bronze medalist in, in London. Yeah. You know, the point you make is home games bring something special. And if you look at every major games, the home country always does well yeah. because it's the, they say it's the extra man in the team. It's the extra, the extra point when you need it. But you've got to bring it yourself. Yeah, you've yeah. got to have that intention. And as we saw in the success, if you invest well, you can get a good return. Yeah. Not only in medals, but in what you can do to inspire what the pledge was of 2012, a generation. Yeah, because if, if you take that 2012 era, I mean, Anthony Joshua has become the ubiquitous man of boxing. Lawrence Coley, very well, very good performance. I predicted he would win by knockout. I didn't think it was going to be in six rounds, but he, he disposed of Glowacki, won a belt. Luke Campbell's had a pretty good career. Uh, sadly, Anthony Ogogo had his career ended with an injury. Yeah. But apart from that, they, um, then of course you had Nicola Adams. Yeah. Who went on to become a good pro. So that was a very, very rich reign of form in the boxing that emerged from there. So, you know, Karate being a, team, a sport that wasn't allowed to be in the Olympics, do you f did you feel short, uh, uh, blindsided? Do you feel like you was being cheated of achieving bigger and a greater excellence if you had that chance to compete in the Olympics? What was going, was there a lot of politics as a reason why Olympics didn't really recognize karate? What was going on there? But sport was politics, politics is sport. One of my great regrets, and the reason I walked away from the sport, yet to peak in my sport, was the fact that I'd achieved everything I wanted to achieve and I wanted to take onto an Olympic stage. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you, you, if you set yourself goals and standards of excellence, you have to be able to expand them and seek new environments and arenas in which to test yourself. And the Olympics was that for me, that's why I walked away. I did track and field, did the 400 hurdles, still retained a presence of coaching in karate, but the officials, a number of issues saw the sport not recognized, which is why when it achieved recognition for Tokyo, it rekindled a fire in me. It, that, it, I would be a liar to say any differently. But the audacity of being able to look at where we've come from as a sport to gain Olympic recognition only from Tokyo in its games as the, the home of karate, birthplace of karate do in its modern form. Right. And then to see it off the Olympic program for Paris in France, where French karate and French politics of sport would have seen us now as a permanent Olympic discipline is one of the great disappointments. But that's why my attempt to qualify and gain selection for the games was partially rekindled out of a dream that was unfulfilled, but fighting for the streets, because those lives on the streets should be competing in those games and winning gold for Britain. Yeah, see, I mean, you and I come from the streets. I mean, obviously, albeit in the United States and you here in England, so we have a lot of uh, things in common in that respect. But I think a lot of people don't really understand or don't get when people say that. Um, and it's not being facetious. It's not trying to uh, glorify street violence. So we want to clarify that. But I think as you, you very eloquently put that um, when you took your transgressions or you took your aggressions into the sport, it almost becomes easy because it becomes second nature. This is what your environment was like. So now I'm gonna take that element of what I'm dealing with into this controlled environment. And I'm gonna to try to dominate this individuals in front of me that's probably between me and the medal or me and my performance. When, <clears throat> when you look at boxers, point, we're gonna talk about boxers just for, mm -hmm. uh, for a moment. One of the reasons why boxers especially are looked upon with reverence is because people tend to feel or understand that a lot of good boxers come from very, very poor, underprivileged backgrounds. Correct. And they take that aggression and then they transcend that into the sport they're in. And in most so-called working class sport, that seems to be the norm. It does work in other elite sports like, I don't know, um, equestrian, I guess, rowing, I guess. <laughs> you know, um, and rugby was that way for a while. It was a, quite an elite sport for a while. And that yeah. became a working man. Now we have a, and England has a black captain, um, who, who captains a team. So I, 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 what do you say about race and sport? Why is it a factor? This is a deep one because you've got to go back to slavery. Mm -hmm. You've got to go back where the sheer athleticism born out of surviving that second passage in that slip, in that ship and in that hold. When you got to your destination, you were of a super bred 
resilience. And when you're on that plantation, you performed for your master. Slaves would box against rival slave plantation owners. Their buck became their prize and money was bet, the first betting and, and the exchange of pugilism and boxing were done in that way. And it went into running and it went into horse racing and it went to other aspects that made their massa more money. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed too much if we're really honest about it. We look intergenerationally. That's why when we have the draft in the States, mm -hmm. it hasn't changed much from how one drew the best of each plantation to compete and improve the bottom line of their owners. Yeah. All that's happened now is the economics are more widely spread for those who make it to the very top. But as I've said, you know that strength and depth comes from a social and cultural hunger and desire. Mm -hmm. Any of those sports that you know that are the sports that are revered but on the basis that you can transcend and overcome so much life adversity right. and then become what many would not commit because there is no secret. The hard work, the hard hours are no different to the plantation hard work and hard hours. The migration from the South to the North, the migration of my mother and father from the Caribbean to Britain as that Windrush generation. Mm -hmm. They were invited here to rebuild the mother nation. Right. That's why I say to people, my father fought for this country. I've represented this country and I've now served it in public life. That's an extraordinary journey, but don't ever tell me I don't have a right. Yeah. And that responsibility comes and that's why I've been really emboldened by watching LeBron James, watching a new generation of sports activism following George Floyd, yeah. you know, making their achievements felt, shifting the dial on the owners that say, if we take, you know, Colin Kaepernick, people will re revere and remember him years from now, but for that type of sacrifice, there is a price. He has paid that price, but I hope he'll be adequately respected and given his rightful place. Because when he took the knee, everyone said he was mad. The knee was first taken by Martin Luther King and Martin Luther VI as an act of defiance. And we need to understand what it represents. So when Colin Kaepernick took the knee, and then we globally took the knee, sport activism found a new dimension of influence and impact. But when you've got LeBron James with 60 million followers on Twitter, he even got the black vote out. When he spoke, when his colleagues spoke, his fellow professionals spoke in 1968, Muhammad Ali, when he was challenging his stance for not um, fighting the Vietnam War. That Cleveland summit brought all of, of America's black sporting excellence. And that's the type of unification of purpose and commitment that improves the, it for the lives of those communities that we've come from and actually transcends from it just being who look like us because it's only through diversity that you achieve all lives that must matter. Mm -hmm. But where our lives have been black does not I know I'm a black man as of last May 25th. For the first time in many years, Jeff Thompson is a black man. He'd like just to be Jeff Thompson, mm -hmm. a former five times world champion, a, 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 someone who's achieved many things in his life. But I'm a black man now and I don't walk away from that. I'm proud of that. So I'm black and I'm proud. You know, all those seventies, you know, the music, the, the, you know, the, the, that whole sort of expression from the streets. That's why watching our streets, what came from the streets in gangster rap, in drill, that's the frustration of the streets. Mm -hmm. So whilst we're feeling the beat, the moves, the bump and the grind, we need to be hearing what the words are because they will depict how it is being felt by our current youth culture and why they ain't taking it. Mm -hmm. And not many of them are prepared to commit to that dedicated effort. Why would they? Mm -hmm. They want to be smart, they want to be clever. They've got the ability to do so. But in karate, we haven't got the strength and depth. In boxing, we haven't got the strength and depth. In judo, we haven't got the strength and depth. In Britain, per head per population, we won the most successful combat sport nations in the world. But let's look at the Eastern Bloc countries. Croatia, Kazakhstan, Serbia, war-torn countries. They have a hunger and desire and instinct 
that brings it to any of their environment. Look at UFC, mixed martial arts. Whenever I see the individual, I immediately go to their geographic country of origin. Then I go into their community. Then I go into their background. That will tell me the nature of who we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole movement of where sport is, again, led by the new generation of sporting activists, watching our women athletes, the WNBA, they've been extraordinary. But it's having the diversity of activism mm -hmm. because that's how you overcome the injustices of the time. So for me, it is about stepping up. I am the elder now. So I have to make sure that the young guns step up, but they express it in the ways that we have done from the time we were enslaved to the times that we would feel we could be emancipated. So when you are, you said to me a number of occasions and you're saying it now on air, your intention is, is to compete in the next Olympics in, in the karate and to be, make the selection. What do you say to any young cat in your sport that says, come on, Jeff, you served your time. You've done your bit. Let us youngsters do it. Why are you trying to get in here? What do you say to that as being a man who's of advanced age, you've accomplished a lot in the sport, albeit not an Olympic level, but at world championship level, you've done it multiple times. What do you say to that? Why are you still competing? Why do you feel the need to compete now? The need to compete on January the 3rd, 1993, a 14-year-old schoolboy was shot dead on the streets of Moss Side. His name was Benji Stanley. Not many people will remember Benji Stanley. They will remember Stephen Lawrence, who was murdered literally weeks later, and James Bulger. 27, 28 years on, as of this week, March 23rd, hundreds of lives have been lost under the age of 21 that should have had a chance through sport and the arts and cultural activity like myself and so many others to develop and realize their potential in life, just life. Yep. In 2019, and I have now, through the Youth Charter, a UN NGO, we've advocated and campaigned and inspired the Sport for Development for Peace movement. Seven prime ministers on, I have not been able to get the sustainable impact of young men and women, predominantly looking like me, to have the same opportunities I had. So therefore, you have to step up at a time where no, 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 no charitable effort has any merit unless it has celebrities. It's one of the great pluses and minuses. So I had to do something so audaciously considered mad in its intent that I would, in that purpose of intent, be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. My intention to qualify for Tokyo is fighting for the streets. Those lives that have been lost on the streets that motivate me to put in the hours that I'm putting in and putting myself through, I might add, what I never thought was possible. Because I was told that because of my age, it couldn't be done. Then I was told I was too aggressive at one of the National Olympic Training Centers. I was banned from training because I was told I was too aggressive. Where did you ever hear that BS? <laughs> How can you be too aggressive in a combat sport where that's the very essence and fuel you need to channel and show the discipline? But I trained with those young up and coming Olympic hopefuls and I held my own. And then it sparked something in me. And as you know, my son, as a professional boxer, and I would say one of the more dangerous individuals I've ever met in or out of the ring, is the one that keeps me sharp. He's kept my bubble where it needs to be. And what I'm saying is, as I went through and reawoke muscle memory, reawoke what happens between the ears, but more importantly, what motivates this, all I would say to the young'uns, you should have danced me off the floor, put me in my chair, mm -hmm. and had me record and assess you. I should not have the audacity to be able to announce and do what I'm aiming to do. However, we've discussed where I've come from, what's inspired me, what continues to motivate me. So as lives are lost, as we speak, a life was lost on Monday in Hounslow. There's my motivational fuel for today's session. Before when I did it, I was competing because I was by way of my color and what people expected me not to achieve, always wanted to prove a point. Mm -hmm. So how can anyone want to challenge the lives lost that motivate me because I'm haunted by them and yet inspired by them? What they were not able to realize in their potential is what I intend to bring 
in my potential quest in making this what people seemingly say is impossible. Who said so? Nothing is impossible. What is age? Age is numbers. That's why I've said to everybody, those young guns, whomever, if you want to come and dance, please come into my bubble. I'm more than willing to come and dance. Whatever tempo, whatever pace, let's dance. And of course, the freak-like nature of what I did in the yesteryear is now informed with wisdom. Experience teaches wisdom. I know how hard to train, when to rest, when to recover. These are the things we never observed. And I was the first generation that looked at sports science. But ultimately, it's all between the ears. And I'm bringing it because it's too important not to. And I don't know what will happen, but even now, the levels I've got to, to be able to declare last week that I'm available for selection. Right. English Karate Federation, they all know my intention. The right. British Karate Federation know my intention. But here's the thing. We have a wonderful heritage of world heavyweight karate champions. We have produced five world heavyweight karate champions. At this present moment in time, Britain does not have a world-class heavyweight. Speaks for, and by the way, we could say that, apart from boxing, judo, wrestling, all of the combat sports we excelled in. We've got some good representation of Taylor Muhammad is keeping it real in Taekwondo, and we've got some other good strength and depth of talent and potential. But for me, they should be off the streets, they should be in those combat sport disciplines, mixed martial arts, wherever they wanna be, Terry. I would prefer to see them in those environments than having their lives taken outside of those environments. And I can speak from experience because I nearly lost my son to all that madness and nonsense. Mm. He carries the name of one of his best friends on his trunks, Ryan Wilson, who lost his life with the difference of my son only not losing his life by a text. That was the difference, Terry. Mm. And after that life was lost in Ryan and Ryan had come to our house with uh, birthday parties, you know, just to come and play. He wasn't expected to lose his life. He was living in Elmstead. He wasn't in the ghetto, black flight to see him leave Moss side for a better time and a better chance and life opportunity. So I, I say to anybody who wants to, again, challenge my motives, um, the bubble of the discipline of the last year has been transformative. It's allowed me to, to get back into where I need to be. And I welcome the detractors and spirit snipers because as I said, um, you know, the great thing about having the time to watch the Ali's re-inspired since Black Lives Matter, a whole unbelievable priceless currency of black achievement throughout the years. So I'm well comfortable in my skin. I know who I stand for, whose shoulders of greatness I stand upon, and those streets I need to fight for, compete for, qualify for, and win. Anyone who's of delusion, I'm just qualifying, is delusional. They do not know me. If they take the time to know me, then they will understand. If they don't, come train with me, come spar with me, and then they'll understand where I'm coming from, where I'm at, and where I'm going. So it's more like a socio-political statement that you're- Of course it is, making. absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. And um, by making your intentions known to the British Federation, um, British Karate Federation, that you are, you had the intention uh, for your open for selection, do you think they will select you? Um, I've had my first meeting on Monday. I declared my intentions last Wednesday. Um, the irony of all of this, what would have been the more difficult in training, preparing and ensuring I was able to make myself available for selection and then mm -hmm. going on the square and entering into the 21st karate competition environment. Right. It's, it's the qualification. Karate is not as unified, it's not as organized as it should be, or I would expect it to be. Mm -hmm. The governance isn't right. So I'm now almost in a frustrated place. Of course, I've got to get the, the sponsorship and funding to get me to Croatia and get me to Paris. But right. I don't let those things stop me now. It never did then. But um, selection, I've met the performance director by Zoom. Um, a meeting was supposed to have taken place between the British Karate Federation and the English Karate Federation to make sure our athletes get to the Europeans as elite performers. You've then got the logistics of um, still a covid um, culture that we're still trying to get to, to grips with. Mm -hmm. Vaccinations. I want the right vaccination. I don't want anything injected into my body. 
I'm not that naive to be that trusting where a Pfizer CEO doesn't take his vaccine. So why would I want to take the Pfizer vaccine? I'm sorry, I'm from the street. I've got a common sense degree. So you ain't bringing it to me if you ain't bringing it to yourself. I believe in lead by example. So if the, if the, if I used to eat my patties and sell my patties. <laughs> so if my man isn't going to have an injection, so Boris had his injection, I want what Boris had. If yeah. I have what Boris had, like sickle cell anemia, I know that we as a diaspora need to be given further consideration. But there's a lot to consider. But I do know is this. I am in a really good place mentally, physically, and emotionally. I understand what this represents. Right. And by all counts, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be nice to have the, the third trilogy of the, the, the Terry Long or Jeff Thompson interactions talking about a fantastic intent that became a fantastic reality? Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. I, I, and, and I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't put it, but I, I, you know, I know your level of determination. I, I wouldn't put it past you uh, to, to achieve that if you're given an opportunity. It's funny, I was talking to uh, Glenn, remember Glenn? Oh, we used, yeah. uh, I was talking to Glenn uh, just before we came to this park on my way over here. Uh, I'm actually at the gym in, uh, in North London. Okay. Yeah. And um, he still remembers those great conversations we had, you know, about having to reflect about what things look like us up and down the country. Uh, and when you don't see it in these walls, it, it's, it, you have to reflect and say, there's a reason for that. And, you know, you are trying to change the narrative as well. So there's a lot bef before that. I mean, that sort of, that, that beautiful, eloquent point kind of leads us into my next question. Life as a world champion, when you were a world champion, it's something that Anthony Joshua is experiencing now. And when you're at the top, when you're at the pinnacle of your career, when you are seen as the top dog, it doesn't mean you've made it if you wanna stay in the sport. It means the snipers have just made their range even more uh, refined. It becomes, the shooters become better uh, expert shooters. Uh, the critics become expert critics. Um, the haters become greater haters. And so for what was like for you as a world champion while you were champion representing your, your country? I'll give you a fantastic example. So came back from Taiwan in 82, double world champion, led the British team, world heavyweight champion, English championships in the February of what would have been 1983. Right. And the heavyweight category would normally attract maybe 15 to 20 fighters. I remember turning up the English karate, um, championships and there must've been about 45 to 50 heavyweights. And I walked in and they looked at me and I looked at them and I went, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of my toughest ever competitions and one of my most enjoyable achievements because three of the British team in the late Libby White, God rest his soul, Jerome Atkinson, Charles Longland Hughes, you know, these were all part of that strength and depth. And in any sport, in any winning team, you need strength and depth. That strength and depth from the streets you come from that become refined and polished to the levels of excellence mm -hmm. said to me, that with that, and once I'd won that, it, it, it sort of cemented and gave me the true credibility I felt I needed to come back onto home soil and right. do it in front of a home crowd. Right. And then it means that what the stories that you tell people about how you've won or the, the articles that they read gives you a, a legitimacy to, to, to swagger with humility, and not, with, not with arrogance. I've always said mine has never been arrogance, it's been a confidence. Right. And you know, in any sport for any winner, any champion, Confidence is the secret ingredient that takes hours and years to discover, and you can lose it like that. That's right. So it, being the hunter, to then becoming the hunted, are two completely different things. That's why the 85 win was the most satisfying win. When you come back from adversity, it is sweeter in its nectar of victory. Mm. So for, I, I look at, I don't know what it would have been like to have had the multimedia age, the digital age, when I look at the sessions we did and the, the performances we had, we'd have been a phenomenon. But I do look at Anthony Joshua. I do look at Lewis Hamilton. I do look at, you know, um, um, Nicola Adams. You know, um, we've got some fantastic talent, but I just want them to be aware of who they are mm -hmm. and, and to be conscious of what it means, not only to them and to their sport, to their country, but their diaspora. Yeah. And it means there are so many 
so much more pressure placed upon them. I'd say in my era, you had a lot more time to be focused. The distractions were as much as you allowed them to play a part in what you wanted to see happen. But um, the talent we have, those that are doing us proud, I think is going to be a case now and, and a reawakening, a generation have become, you know, re-emboldened since George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. An honest and uncomfortable discussion is now taking place. And that's what we should be able to do in a free democracy, a free speech, respectful free speech. So sport as a reflection of society, as an influence in society. You know, Diane um, um, Asher Smith, she talks about, you know, what it is to be a black woman. You know, Serena Williams, you know, these sisters and brothers are bringing it now. And, you know, Marcus Rashford, but there's so many more. Don't, don't make it so you're the single target. Make it a collectivism. And that's where you see real sustainable and impactful change result. So do you think the black athletes of your era were slightly more conscious of their blackness or their contribution to the greater society than the black athletes now? I think, and I'm being very measured as I, as I run through my conscious, subconscious archive, in my generation, it was part of an every single day existence. There was not a day where you didn't have a reason or an encounter or an experience where people responded or reacted to you, either in a subconscious or consciously in different way. Right. The current times in which we live, I never thought I'd see with eight minutes, 54 seconds of a, a life that looked like us taken, mm -hmm. which was then watched by the world and responded to by the world as an injustice that was wrong, fundamentally wrong. And what's happened since that I'd be talking to you watching change and America has changed. You know, America is the cultural reference point for the world. South Africa is the youngest democracy of where the racial continued existence or equal justice is applied. But America is the benchmark. So to see where America is, it's still in its challenge and opportunities says to me here in this green and pleasant land that, you know, Lewis Hamilton seems to be out on his own um, in one of the most dangerous sports. Watching Naomi Nasaka take activism onto the court for the US Open. Every round, she took a face of the sisterhood that needed Breonna Taylor. You know, there were so many and she still delivered. So I think we've got an extraordinary generation. And I think they just need to be aware of one another, support one another, be in concert with one another, as we had in the 80s, and as they wouldn't know I exist. But, but then again, where is the history and, and, and archive of just what we brought back in those 80s that built a generation for the 90s, that built, you know, as we went from 20th century to 21st century? But it was interesting. I was watching a Netflix um, series and, um, you know, three young females, American females, really close and the reference was made to Muhammad Ali. And I just smiled. And it was, you know, his legend lives on, his legacy lives on. Because it was real, it was relevant. It was, you know, it was real Netflix time. That's right. And I think we just really need to have a place and a reference where those who have had that incredible journey from street to stadium to rostrum, or been able to take their communities with them, transcend their cultures to broader cultures. You know, the one thing I've always said you haven't got to like me. You haven't got to, be want, to want me in your home, albeit I may have done so through a screen, mm -hmm. but respect me. Respect me so when I stand to be counted and on the basis of who I represent and who I want to continue to challenge, because if we don't challenge, there is no change. Yeah. So I just want to see the current generation continue to challenge. They're a fantastic generation. We've always been blessed with gifts and talents and skills. But when they go to compete, know that they're competing more than for themselves or a sponsor or, or something that suggests that by the gold, it's not enough. It's not enough. As they come off that rostrum, they need to be keeping it real. You know, I'd go into the, 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 the young offenders institutions. I'd go into the boardrooms. I'd go into the streets. I'd go to the barbershops. I'd go anywhere where I know who looks like me tells me it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Don't ever accept that notion it cannot be done. My grandfather said, there's no such thing as can't. It's not in the vocabulary of the Thompson Bacchus diaspora. We're a village of slaves. My mother was the warrior. 
I've done the ancestry. Knowing where you've come from gives you that defined sense of who you are in the present. And then you can make your future, but there should be no barrier to the gifts and talents and potential. And if we're only 1.7% of this green and pleasant land, it cannot be, on, be beyond the social, cultural, economic and political will that we contribute positively rather than taking one, our, each other's lives on the streets. That's correct. Well said. I mean, having said that, I mean, you, you made reference to the fact that, um, you know, Anthony Joshua and all the rest of the uh, current athletes, if they support one another, and I think there's a very good point when you think of someone like Lewis Hamilton, he is out on his own, not just because he's the only black athlete in that particular sport, but I think you're making reference to the fact that in terms of support and support network, it doesn't seem to be beyond his father and obviously his, his nucleus family that support him. It doesn't seem to be a great deal of support to his efforts, especially his brilliance, which can't be qu questioned or even uh, become suspicious. Um, Cause he's a brilliant, brilliant driver. Probably one of the best we've ever seen, period. Without um, shadow of a doubt. Well, shadow of a doubt. As we segue into my, my next point, because you made reference to your son, jo Jordan. I want to touch upon him before we close because it's a, very, it's a very interesting dynamic. I've met Jordan a number of times and as a specimen of a kid, he is from a special stock. You know, you're a former world champion. Your wife was a world champion. Um, uh, superior athletes were in your respective fields. Um, and you have these three beautiful kids and there's Jordan who, I, when I first met Jordan, he tried his hand at tennis. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in the, the, the elite sport that tennis is, he didn't come from that sort of um, sort of uh, nurtured amateur experience of being, because kids in tennis start when he's six, seven years old and all that kind of stuff. He just kind of came into it raw yep. and picked it up. And I remember seeing this kid on court five in, in West London, sorry, hitting this ball like a rocket. And then I heard someone in the background tell me, yep, he's never picked up a tennis racket before in his life prior to those three years he did before he started hitting that ball. And I'm like, so he just started doing that stuff naturally. You know what I mean? He started moving on that court naturally. I mean, with some guidance and with um, with uh, Joe Jury and of course- Alan Jones. Uh, Alan Jones. Alan Jones. Jones. Yeah. I mean, like that's only a few years of work and he's getting that. And, and I said to myself, damn. And then obviously he became disillusioned with the world of tennis as you would if you're not given the opportunities. And then I was present at one of his fights. Remember at the Copper Boxing Ring, he was on the um, Anthony Yardy undercard. Yeah. And I didn't even realize at the time that he was on that undercard. And um, he's campaigning at Cruiserweight. Mm -hmm. I know, Je I mean, Jordan's gonna be in the, in the show. Um, hopefully we'll get him on next week. Yeah. What's that been like as a father figure, but also as a fan, I guess, of your son competing in a combat, another combat sport? What's that been like? I think I, I really want to, firstly, on the basis of how he ended up, as I said, they all had to learn to defend themselves, you know, um, run, swim and fight. Mm -hmm. um, tennis broke my son's heart because we had a rule. The fundamentals, as I've said, run, swim, defend yourself, be able to fight on behalf of yourself and protect others. At 14, I said, you've got to make your choice because I was still traveling with the youth charter. Jan was running youth charter, but she was the one when I was traveling, getting them to the respective places of activity. I tried it one evening, not one of them got to anywhere they were supposed to get to. And I realized that that unique ability that women have, the, the lateral thinking. But to the point, when, he's to, when he said it, and both Luke, my second and said I wanted to play tennis, I actively challenged them. I'd worked with Tim Edmund, I'd worked with David Felger, I'd worked with tennis. I knew what it represented as a glass ceiling. What I had not even begun to understood, it was a double glaze ceiling. And we invested in Jordan. And he was, when we first looked for a coach, we were told he's too late a starter. The one thing I will always say about Jordan, he has a unique gift. Put him at the back of the queue of anything. Show him something once, he will pick it up. He became disenchanted when he went on the men's tour in tennis. And I worked with Tim Henman, I asked him to look at him objectively. And he said, he's got something. Volateri, still with Volateri, wanted to take him as raw talent, $2,000 a week. In my tribe, if you get it now, you ain't getting it when we leave this world. So you have a choice. And he said, I do not want to make that decision until I'm ready. He went on tour for one year. His experiences and treatment 
in the various tennis clubs. He came back and was disillusioned. That's when he ended up on the streets because what we'd exposed him to didn't see him disadvantaged economically, but disaffected socially and culturally. We instilled enough in him. Ryan was murdered. It affected Jordan significantly. And I learned of Jordan's foray into combat sports when I was in South Africa, when someone sent me some footage and said, that's you, are you aware? And he was doing mixed martial arts. He was doing unlicensed boxing because he was just earning his money. Mm. His friends were, were, were dealing in the pharmaceutical industry. He knew how far that step would go across in the line. And I would have heard about it because the streets were what we were committed to with the youth chancer. So when he surfaced, I then sat down with him and said, look, if you're going to do this, the Thompson way is to do it properly. Mm -hmm. I said, here are those that have inspired you. Watch, watch the greats from the 70s through to the 80s, through to the 90s. And then he applied himself. And Haroon Headley, you know, who'd worked with the youth charter, benefiting the youth charter, actually started working with him. Lee Baird, you know, he had a Manchester experience, but I felt he needed to get out of Manchester. Um, and he had some time in Germany with Boxworks, where again, he learned his trade. Being in Germany was, a, was a, a life character forming experience. Came back, then he decided to move to London. Okay. Signed up with um, Frank Warren. And again, you know, in the ring and out of the ring, you've got to navigate. He's now with Don Charles. You know, it's all about relationships. Right. And I don't, I don't cross that line. I brought up my children to be independent in their choices and decisions. They know where the wisdom is. They can refer to it. They can seek it. And then they must decide. Because when he goes in that ring, I ain't going in there. He's taking the heat. So he better know what he set himself in for. But I say this. I have never known a harder right hand punch as well as kick. And I'm saying I have known people not kick as hard as Jordan Edward Beresford Thompson can hit. Tyson Fury said 2019, he had not been hit as hard by anybody other than Jordan Thompson. Because and he, all was, I he say, was in the Fury camp, wasn't he, at one point? Yeah, he was in the Fury camp that got um, Tyson Fury ready for his Dur the Duarte Wilder fight. And he's been part of that continued um, relationship. He's, 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 tra he's, he's sparred with Usk, getting Usk ready and going to another culture of Eastern um, European culture. Jordan has served a good apprenticeship. Yeah. The key now is as he now steps up. And I, I said to him the other day, irony, Lance Coley, Hackney boy, world champion. Jordan Thompson, now staying with my mother in Hackney, suggests that Hackney's going to continue <laughs> making and, and building fantastic talent. All I want to see is the brothers do well. And whoever excels at the end of that encounter, having those epic battles, myself and Vic Charles, you know, rivalries are what makes sport. Ali Frazier, you know, you need those fights because they, but I, I always say, we always need to be respectful and mindful that it isn't black on black crime, black on black violence. Yeah. We respect one another. But Jordan, for me, it's not a boast. It's not an arrogance. It's just a confidence in knowing that he will be a world champion if he's afforded the opportunity. I hope that his experiences in boxing, not what he experiences um, here in tennis, but have no qualms whatsoever that he'll make the grade. So, you know, um, we're, we're definitely gonna hopefully get Jordan on it very shortly um, to get his more in-depth take on boxing because we wanna hear from the boxer's perspective. I know you're giving the father perspective and also as a former fighter of the combat sports yourself. Uh, you mentioned Anthony Joshua earlier, and I want to talk about Anthony Joshua and your view of him. You mentioned Deontay Wilder. We won't go into Deontay Wilder in this particular segment in, at length because obviously he's no longer world champion, and he's was defeated, well, some say twice, but definitely once by his nemesis, um, Tyson Fury. There was an impending fight. Fury, Joshua has been made. Your views on that particular fight, your verdict, your prediction. Views on the fight? This is what dream fights are always about. Two British boxers who are currently holding the respective belts of one of the greatest prizes in sport are going to pit themselves. Sadly, not in this country. It will go where the dollars sure. are best able to meet what I would have liked to have seen here at home at Wembley Stadium or any of the great cathedrals of sport. But nonetheless, to see them both 
meet one another in the ring is something I can't wait to see. The boxers are different. Um, Fury is a natural boxer. He has that Romany blood and he's overcome great life adversity. Anthony Joshua is equally overcome. He's street, he's from the streets. He could have been lost to the streets. Yep. So the sentiment of the youth charter is there. I met him once at the Boxing Writers. He's got a wonderful demeanor. And all he needs to do is bring that hunger and that desire because that's what makes great fights. I don't see it as a one-sided fight. I see it being as an epic encounter. And for me, as long as they give a good account of themselves, whoever chooses to bring it on that night will walk away the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Now that as a prize, as a motivation, as, as the Romanies would be supporting their boy, you know where my support will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you, so you, you basically think it's going to be a 50-50 fight? You know, this is what makes great sporting moments, especially combat sport moments, what they are. You know one punch can end it. Yep. What I know is this. Tyson Fury was hit with a punch that I know came from his ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> And I saw Lazarus get up from the dead. <laughs> you hear what I'm telling you? I'm keeping this real. <laughs> if I did Joshua, he hits Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury knows how to come back from the dead. Mm. All I'm saying is, Anthony had his moment. I've always said, if the fight in the man doesn't happen until the fight is taken out of the man. When you're knocked down, it's how you get back up. And I'm saying, whoever gets back up in that fashion, because I saw Deontay Wilder's fight, face after Tyson Fury got back up. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that was in his subconscious when they met in yeah. 2019. I don't care what anybody says, yeah, yeah. that was there. So that's what brings, for me, so much of what I think makes this such an extraordinary fight. As you say, you know, it's 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 the fighters that matched up the different styles, the different approaches. Who is hungriest in their adversity that brings it to what they want to see themselves immortalized mm -hmm. and remembered? And Andy Joshua is one of those individuals that people underestimate. Tyson Fury is more outgoing in how he expresses himself and how he continues to fight the system. Mm -hmm. Andy Joshua has done it in a more humble way. But as long as he brings that confidence and as long as he brings that expectation of what his diaspora will expect of him and what he will expect of himself. Come on, this is about, this is about defining your and making your mark in history. Mm -hmm. It's not, it is the most dangerous and difficult of sports. That one punch can do it. So uh -huh. if this is going 11, 12 rounds, that for me is not where Joshua needs to be. Joshua needs to be round seven, round eight. He needs to finish business. If he doesn't finish business, the business will go right to the wire. And it will be about who wants it most. If, you had, to pick, if you had to pick a winner, who would you pick? Poof. Do you know what? I've never been presumptuous. I said where my support would be based on the streets, the stadium, the rostrum, the diaspora, what he represents to our young and to any youngster. If he doesn't do it in eight, I see it going to Fury. So my predictions, Ali made his predictions. Anthony Joshua needs to have done his business in eight, eight rounds. Look at his body type. Look at the muscle mass, bone density. Look at everything about him. It is built for that explosive, intense exchange of in purpose and will to win. As the fight gets longer, Tyson Fury is the more natural boxer. He's the one that can tactically and strategically take the rounds, build the weakness, and then exploit and take out the opponent. I think anybody who knows the art would acknowledge that. But when you look at when you look at that fight, um, it's obviously an intriguing matchup because you're uh, right. There are two different styles, and styles make fights. Correct. Do, do you feel that, um, I, I tend to go back to that, that Andy Ruiz Jr. first fight. Yeah. Did that fight tell you a lot about the man in the manner in which he lost? 
Yes, but that's the great thing about loss. You learn from it. And Anthony Joshua went back to school. He went, he went back to school in reflecting upon the loss. Uh -huh. There was a lot going on in the lead up to in his preparation. Yep. Preparation is key. Planning is key. Then you execute. Yep. There was something wrong in his preparation. You could see that. Mm. But how he's come back is the key. And how he applies that lesson learned from loss that he makes and turns it into success. Outside of Anthony Joshua and obviously Tyson Fury, what boxer excites you the most when you turn on the TV or if you were think about boxers now? Is there a current boxer right now that excites you? Jordan Edwin Bersford Thompson. <laughs> well said. <laughs> well said. And on that note, look out for Jordan Thompson as an up and coming cruiserweight. Um, Lawrence Acoli just recently won his first world champion at, at Cruiserweight. I met Lawrence Acoli actually in East London um, about three years ago, prior to him fighting Wadi Camacho. Um, and he basically talked me through how he thought he was going to deal with Wadi Camacho. And to his credit, he dealt with Wadi Camacho in the manner in which he said he was going to do so. And he's improved, in my opinion, in every fight since then. Um, I think his life outside the sport has also improved. You can tell he's dedicated to the sport. Your son is also campaigning at that weight class. And Lawrence Acoli has quietly, well, I'm not sure if it's quietly, but he's made intentions that at some point, once he's done the business at Cruiserweight, he'll try his hand at heavyweight. And why not? Well, six has done it. So there's opportunities for him. Where do you see Jordan? Well, he has to, obviously he has to go for the domestic level. And I'll get more of, of an intake from, uh, um, from Jordan when I speak to him and get him on the, on the podcast. But obviously they're on two different collision courses. He won't, he's not on the collision course with someone like Lawrence Acoli because Lawrence Acoli is now on world level and Jordan is now rising. Is there a pattern that Frank Warren is trying to take Jordan? Can you give us I, I know you've got to ask Jordan, but I know what I want the dream fight to be. I know they've had an exchange of words. I know they've had an exchange of intention. That would be a dream fight. Um, and you know, boxing's about all that it represents in both management, promotion, you know, the, the money that, so, that, that keeps that ecosystem going. Mm -hmm. But um, I know what I'd like to see, but as you say, I'm not getting in the ring. I'm not the one who has to do it, but it, that's for Jordan to share with you. But Jordan's got a clear path, a clear destination, a clear roadmap. And if he's given the opportunity, you know, Lawrence Acoli achieved world success in 15 fights. Right. That's tribute to him and good credit to him. Right. I believe Jordan Thompson could do the same if he's given the opportunity. And Jordan has already worked with heavyweights, held his own with heavyweights, so I can't see that being an obstacle to him. Uh, last, I want to end on your, um, your uh, oh no, I know obviously people uh, have achieved a lot in this country and you've achieved quite a few things. I, correct me if I'm wrong, you are an OBE or CBE? Is that correct? No, I'm, an M I'm an MBE, I'm a member of this, this excellent order of the British Empire. Um, different levels mean different things. So I'm going to stay a member for a while. So um, obviously it means you have met the Queen and yep. you would have had um, that trip to Buckingham Palace uh, to achieve that accolade. Uh, what was that like, meeting the Queen? Um, it was Prince Charles who presided over my ceremony, but I have met the Queen. I've met most of the royal family. It is always a privilege to meet them. But as my mother, I took my mother to Buckingham Palace because it was for her, it was for my father, it was for everything that we represented. And like everything, I would like to, I'd, I'd always like to make use of, I've always said my gold medals were what I would give back to the communities that gave to me. The titles are exactly the same and that's exemplified through the youth charter. And you, have, you only have to look and see what's been realized from tragedy to opportunity. Okay. Um, we now see where the royal family is on all issues of race and responding to the needs and issues that are now, I think, challenging everybody. But um, I know having worked with the, the royal family in various causes of interest that they as a family are interested in all of their citizens. The Queen in particular, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Games next year in Birmingham, which I want to shout out, is going to be the biggest major multi-sport event 
since 2012 games. We had obviously the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in 2014. Mm -hmm. I'm a deputy chair of those games. I take that very seriously because the Commonwealth will come to Britain, the Commonwealth communities and diaspora here in Britain will connect and I believe create a legacy opportunity for all. We've got, you know, so many challenges that we can turn into opportunities. So having met the royal family, engaged with the royal family, at all levels of the royal family, they are an institution. They are there to help unify the country when it's uh, polarized different perspectives and they provide some consistency and they provide a reference point that I believe still has relevance and value to the world and the Commonwealth in particular. Okay, so I, I, I won't really go on into this mega Markle uh, debacle that I call it a debacle in the sense that she's highlighting, you know, obviously the whole thing with Prince Harry in an interview they had at Oprah. We, we need another segment to talk about that in itself. But what has basically been lamented onto the uh, royal families that, you know, yeah, they're racist and they've been racist. They, they've been racist for years, all that kind of stuff. Obviously your experience has been different. Obviously you don't live in Buckingham Palace so you wouldn't really right. know what it's like day in, day out. Um, and as a very conscious black man, as a conscious athlete and a, a leader of the community and, and a leader for the rights of all kids who are trying to fight the way out the ghetto, what's your take on that sort of level of criticism that's now labeled towards them based on that conversation? Real briefly, what would you say to that? All I would say is this, they are the future of the monarchy as all of the young um, children, grandchildren, they are the future. Meghan and Harry provided hope and opportunity for the diaspora of the Commonwealth, diaspora of youth culture and black culture in particular. One can only see that in the royal engagements that they embarked upon, the communities they engaged with. There was something special there. That brings its own pressure. We are talking about institutional structures and systemic cultures that we knew until George Floyd had not been given another awakening as to what needed to change. I see them as the future. I hope it can be reconciled. I think they represent in themselves two globally influential individuals that with their love means that they can provide an example of hope and opportunity. I come from a, a biracial marriage. I know what it's like. I know what we encountered. I know what we were exposed to. So I would most definitely be supporting them and hoping that through love, which transcends all of the ignorance and curiosities of difference and why we should treat one another differently, see them hopefully find themselves. I'd like to see the brothers reconcile because it's never good to see this played out in the public domain and their lives are lived in a bowl where people observe and criticize. So I'm not ever gonna criticize because you've said, we don't live there, we don't know, but I'd like to think that this can be reconciled. And I think the games next year is an opportunity to do just that. Uh, well said. And on that note, I'd like to say a special thank you for this enlightenment, my brother. Um, as as always, point. it's like I can listen to you all day, man. We, we, we kind of go places when we, when we converse. Even many, many times our viewers and listeners don't understand that we converse quite a bit off camera and off the record. And we go there. We travel all over the world and it gets very deep. And it's good to bring some of that deep perspective to the average listener, because I think in sport, there is, there is perspective. We touch upon a lot of things in this, this podcast. And it isn't just about race and sport. It's about life and sport. It's about life. Correct. And every athlete is a human being ex in, uh, incurring their own individual experiences. And they are too heavily judged when they are athletes as they are above and beyond any sort of normal expectation. They are just human beings. They may just have this expectation placed on them because they have a bigger platform. But outside of that, they're no different than you and I. So my brother, thank you for this uh, this opportunity once again. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Likewise, uh, God has a sense of humor. That's all I'll say. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would definitely, um, we're gonna work very hard to get Jordan on the show also and get his perspective. With that, Boxstar, the Boxstar family thanks you kindly and we gotta do it again sometime. Hey, it's always a pleasure, Terry. As you say, we take it deep, we keep it relevant, but it provides food for thought and an enrichment that everyone can take something from and hopefully apply it in their lives. So My peace and blessings. Take care. I wish you all the best in your endeavors with making the, um, the trials and obviously the worlds, and we hope to hear good things from you in that respect. 
Thanks very much. Thank Take, you. Care. Take care, Jeff. Bye. Bye.